check. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the children's message. Why do you think we'd want to be able to see the baptismal font? 
It reminds us, when you see something, it reminds you of it, right? So it reminds you that you are what? Baptized, right? Every time you look at a baptismal font, even though you can't remember your baptism because you were so young, I can't remember my baptism, when I see a baptismal font, I remember that I am baptized. And I am baptized into Christ, into Jesus. There's a hymn that goes like that. I am baptized into Christ. I'm a child of paradise. Yeah? Because you are a child of the Heavenly Father, because you're washed with water and the Word, every time you look at a baptismal font, it reminds you that you have eternal life. Not because of anything that you've done, because you and I, we've sinned, it's all we're to be, but, but because of what Christ has done for us. He has given us his word of forgiveness and love. And so when you look at the baptismal font, you can remember that you're a child of the Heavenly Father, that you're a child of God, and nothing can, can separate you from his love. So every time you see a baptismal font, whether it's here or in another church, you remember that you are a child of the Heavenly Father because He has made you one. Okay? You remember that every time you see a baptismal font now? Remember that you are a baptized child of God. And guess what? I'll tell you a little secret. It becomes more and more important the older you get. The older you get, the more important it gets to know that He has made us His children. He has changed us. Alright? So let's say a little echo prayer today. Okay? Let's pray. O gracious Lord, O gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we thank you, we thank you, that through the water and word, that through the water and word, you have made us, you have made us, your children, your children, and that we have, and that we have, eternal life, eternal life, in Christ, in Christ, in Jesus' name we pray.
peace and mercy to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we continue our romp through the book of Romans. We're right in the middle of the book of Romans now, in Romans chapter 7. And as I said last week, Romans is one of those books in the New Testament that every Christian, every Lutheran should be reading several times each year. Now last week we heard about our baptismal union with Christ and his death. Namely that God in baptism has declared all of us dead to sin and alive to him in Christ. That each and every one of us we have been baptismally buried with Christ in his death so that we may be raised with Christ in his resurrection. And as a result, we are to agree with God's word to us in baptism and consider ourselves dead to the lordship of sin and alive to the lordship of Christ Jesus. Now Romans chapter 7 deals with the reality, the reality of living in this forensic tension between the now of faith and the not yet of sight. This time between our baptismal death and resurrection and our ultimate and final death and resurrection. Now don't get me wrong here. I am not saying that we are not really already dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. We are. But not in a way that we ourselves can perceive it. There is no outward difference between a baptized person and an unbaptized one. You cannot go to the terminal at Gerald R. Ford International Airport and look at all the people standing at the gates and say, this one's baptized and this one's not. Oh, you might make an educated guess or two. You might see a woman wearing a cross or a man reading his Bible. But there is no discernible outward difference between someone who is a baptized believer and someone who is not. Well, you might say, well, what about good works? Well, atheists do good works too. Well, what about prayer? Well, lots of people pray to all sorts of false gods. Unlike circumcision, which was an outward visible mark in the flesh, baptism is an inward mark. Hidden is an inward hidden mark of the Holy Spirit. The heart is new, but the flesh is old. We are new creatures in Christ, living inside of old creature creations in Adam. And that creates a tension. That creates a tension in this life, which is what Romans 7 is all about. You are forensically dead, meaning that God has spoken you to death. And when God speaks, it is so, no matter how long it takes in time for that to happen. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The word says, be light, be sea, and dry land, be fruitful and multiply, and it happens ever thereafter, because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The word says, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And 700 years later it happens because the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And it is the same with you and it is, it is the same with me in our baptism. God has spoken. He has declared you dead to sin and death ahead of your death. And so dead you are. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now the Apostle Paul compares it to the marriage covenant. The law of marriage is binding only so long as both parties are alive. It is till death us do part. Once a spouse has died, the legal bond of marriage is ended. In the same way, we are legally bound to sin and death by the law. This is the condition in which we are all born. It is the condition in which you were born. But now, by the baptismal word of God, you have died to the law through the body of Christ, into which you were baptized. 
You were once captive to sin and death, but now you have been liberated. You have been set free by being declared dead to sin, death, and the law. Now remember the way sin, death, and the law are connected. If you don't get this, you won't understand what Paul is saying, and you won't see how it works in your own life. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Now work it backwards. What gives sin its power is the law, the commandment of God. Yes, that's right. It's not intuitively obvious, but true nonetheless. The law of God empowers sin and gives it its potency. And it is sin that is the stinger of death. So the very commandment that promised life becomes death in the presence of sin. So take away the law and you take away the potency of sin. Disempowered sin and death has lost its sting. And that is what Jesus did for you and that is what Jesus did for me. And that is what Jesus did for all of us. Jesus disempowered sin by becoming sin for us. Jesus took the stinger of death into his own flesh, his perfect flesh, his sinless flesh, his flesh that never once had a single evil thought or desire, much less a deed. And in so doing, fulfilled the law. Jesus fulfilled the law because he loves you, because he loves you in a way that you or I cannot understand. It is so far beyond us. You might say that he's become the anti-serum to the poison of the law. He became sin and let the law kill him. And in rising from the dead, having defeated death, he now becomes for you the anti-serum, the medicine of immortality that heals the poison of the law that is killing you. The thing we do not ever seem to get straight for it is so hard for us, this, for us to get this straight in our old Adam because it is so, so foreign to our flesh, to the old Adam. The thing that we do not ever seem to get straight is that the law, the law doesn't make sinners better. The law does not improve us. In fact, the law makes things worse. Piling commandments on a sinner is like pouring gasoline on a fire. I'm not sure if anyone has noticed, but at the very bottom of my emails is the saying, God's saving plan is one of grace, not one of improvement. God's saving plan is not centered on, it is not focused on, it is not built on you behaving better. It is fully and only in and through his beloved Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and his life, his death, and his resurrection for you. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus, not you and not me. Now the Apostle Paul uses an example from his own life in Romans 7 here. He studied the law. And he read in the law, do not covet. Previously, he had no notion that coveting was even sinful. As we know, coveting is idolatry of the heart. But that's not extremely obvious at the first glance. So you would think that having read the law, do not covet, Paul then would begin getting all that coveting out of his life and making some improvements in the greed department. But the opposite actually happened. Sin grabbed a hold of the opportunity created by the commandment and produced all sorts of covetous desires in Paul, and he died and killed him. The commandment that promised life killed him. So this is the formula. Sin plus the law equals death. And that is what killed Jesus. For he became our sin, and the law killed him. Sin plus the law equals death. So when you apply the law to sinners, and there is no one who is without sin, you are going to kill them. Now in a good way, yes, but there's still a death. 
And that is what Jesus meant in this morning's reading from the Gospel of Matthew, where he says, Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. To take up your cross is to take up your death and follow Jesus to his death. Because it's ultimately and finally only in death that we are freed from the law. The way a married person is freed from the law of marriage. There's a lesson here for each and every one of us. Do not expect a steady diet of the law. Do not expect a steady diet of commands. Do not expect a steady diet of do this or don't do that to make you into a better person. The law doesn't change a sinner into a saint. For sinless saints are born, not made. They must be born from above in baptism by water and spirit. All that the law can do is to kill the sinner. And this is the purpose of the law. It is to kill us. It is to bring us to our knees with the understanding that I can do nothing to save myself, and I mean nothing. And that is the work of the law. That is the purpose of the law. Now, the law of God is good. It is holy. It is just. It is pure, and it is perfect, and more. But when you apply the holy law of God to someone like me who has the sin virus, it is going to prove fatal. Not only that, but sin will be amplified to the point that it becomes sinful without measure. Now, there is a lot of practical implication here. You do not need new programs. You do not need new prayers. You do not need the latest and the greatest from some TV evangelist to improve yourself. You need to die and rise in Jesus' death and resurrection. You need to consider yourself and see yourself for what God says you are, dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And how do we stay in Christ? Well, through his holy word and through his sacraments, the means of grace. And you need to stay in them over and over and over again, dying and rising in Christ day after day. You need to understand how the law works. It works in three ways, and you may have memorized it once as curve, mirror, and guide. And those aren't bad, bad ways to think of it, as curve, mirror, and guide. But I'd like to tweak it just a bit without changing their meaning. First, God uses the law to keep us all in line. That's the curve. He works through parents. He works through government. He works through authority structures. He uses the law of the land and Robert's rules of order to do damage control, to keep us, <clears throat> to keep us from walking on each other's lawns, to keep us from cutting into each other's lanes, to keep us from grabbing at each other's throats. And so he curbs the sinner to keep him in bounds so he doesn't hurt himself or others. And that is the outer use of the law. You can't curb the heart. You can't pass laws about thoughts and desires. You can only curb outward behavior to keep the order. The second use of the law, God uses the law to do the deep diagnosis of our condition, and that is the law as a mirror. He lifts what Paul calls the veil of Moses and interprets the law the way Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. He shines the law directly into our hearts like a spiritual MRI. And he reveals to us the true nature of our sinfulness. It's not just that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. It's that we are infected by sin through and through. It's not just that we have problems, but we are the problem. That is what Paul is talking about here in the epistle reading. The law goes to the inner recesses of our heart and reveals that we do not fear, love, and trust in God above all things. But instead, we are at the heart covetous idolaters. That sin you think is just a little thing. That sin that you think is just a little thing. 
when it is viewed in the perfect holiness of God, is utterly sinful beyond measure. Every gossipy word, every adulterous look, every covetous desire is another symptom of how deep the condition goes. And that is why we continually need Christ. Why we continually need Jesus, for he is the medicine of immortality. Who became our sin and died our death, who took death's stinger and disarmed it. He kept the law. He kept the law perfectly, and the law killed him in our place. And he conquered it all in his dying and rising. And now being baptized into Christ is to be reborn in him. To become something completely new. A new you. The old you in Adam, yes, is still around. But the now you are new in Christ. For God himself has declared the old you dead. You are no longer bound to sin. That marriage is ended. You are free to be bound to Christ, which is true freedom. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now that brings us to the final and third way that God uses the law as a guide. Something we will hear about in the next couple of weeks in the epistle to Rome. That he puts the law into the hands of the new you. He puts the law into the hands of the new you and says, now you. Now you mortify the old you. Drown that old Adam of yours in baptism every time he rears his ugly head. Say no to his sinful desires. Don't follow his sinful heart. As I said last week, do not put sin back up on the throne again. It leads only to death. But follow the heart of Christ which you have that leads to eternal life. In other words, now that we are free from the law, God gives us the law to do what he has already declared to be done in baptism. Mortify the old you. You're already dead in Christ. You have nothing to lose but sin and death. So now live as one who is widowed to sin, but living to God in Christ Jesus. And we'll have much more on that next one. Now the take-home thought for today is this. This is the take-home thought for today. Rules and regulations, laws and commandments, will not make you better or less of a sinner or improve your status with God. But being baptized into Christ, you are already now a sinless saint in the eyes of God you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. You have been covered with his righteousness. You have been rescued from death. And you have been brought to life. You and the old Adam no longer live as far as God is concerned. And the life you now live in the flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and who gave his life to save you. You are free in Christ. Yes. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand to sing the hymn of, the, hymn of response to the offering.